Hello, and welcome to the Thinking Jew Podcast, where we dive deep into Torah and Judaism to uncover its hidden beauty. Come join us as we take a closer look and breathe new life into traditional Jewish ideas. And now, here's your host, Rabbi Moshe Siegel. Hello, and welcome to episode 49. Today I want to discuss the concept of the mikvah. A mikvah, which is basically a ritual bath, has a very special and unique role in Jewish law. There's basically three functions that the mikvah has in modern Jewish life, and they are as follows. Number one, to purify a spiritually impure male or female. Number two, the final stage of the conversion process to Judaism is to go into a mikvah. And lastly, when one purchases new food vessels, they need to first be placed into a mikvah before you use them. So again, the three cases are ritual impurity, conversion, and using new food vessels. Now, if we look at all three of them from a more holistic viewpoint, I believe the common thread between all of them is that they're all transformational. The mikvah has the power to transform. It has the ability to take a non-Jew and make them into a Jew. To take a ritually impure person, a tummy person, and transform them into a wholly elevated one. And lastly, it has the ability to elevate our food vessels as well, which at first glance you might be thinking doesn't sound quite as transformational as the first two. So again, I'll direct you to episode 5 for a deeper understanding of that. So I want to first begin with explaining the basics of what exactly a mikveh is, and then we'll continue to dive deeper, understand how it works, and the more deep Kabbalistic understanding of the mikveh. So let's begin. Everywhere the Torah describes purifying oneself from ritual impurity, it always says something along the lines of, and you shall wash your body in water. Without going into all of the details, the Talmud proves from various verses that this means immersing your entire body completely inside the mikvah waters in one dip and having no separation between yourself and the mikvah. Since the average person in Talmudic measurements was one amma by one amma by three ammas, that becomes the minimum size of a mikvah, and the amount of water to fill that size hole is 40 saw, which is roughly 200 gallons of water. This water has to be completely untouched by man. So it can either be a natural body of water, such as a lake, a stream, an ocean, or more practically for those of us living in cities, you use rainwater. Now it's important to understand that once you have the required 40 saw of water, those 200 gallons of natural water, your mikvah is kosher. And now you can go ahead and manually add as much water as you want after that, and the mikvah will remain kosher. So most mikvahs practically nowadays have something called a bor, which means a pit, that contains the minimum amount of rainwater. And then that's connected to a larger bath area, which is where we actually go into and use. And often, if you look carefully, you'll actually see a hole, it's normally two to three inches in diameter, that connects these two different compartments. Practically, this allows us to keep the water clean and refresh the water frequently while maintaining the legal requirements of the Torah of having that 40 saw of natural water. That's what a mikveh is. And it will only purify a person when there is absolutely no separation between one's body and the water. The verse states in Leviticus chapter 15, verse 16, and you shall wash all of your body in water. And the Talmud understands from this that there can't be any separation, which in Hebrew we refer to as a chatzitzah. So that's the basics of what a mikveh is and how it's used. Let's go deeper now and try to uncover some of the more hidden meanings of the mikveh. Let's think about what we just learned about the mikvah and see what exactly is it telling us. The primary element of the mikvah itself is that it has to be made of natural water. Humans can't be involved in any part of the initial setup process. The second element we saw was that we learned that when you enter the mikvah, a person or a food vessel has to have no separation at all between the water and the object immersed. A person has to be completely unclothed without even knotted hairs or anything like that. And a food vessel has to be completely clean without any of the manufacturer's stickers on it or the goo from the stickers remaining on it. So if we put these two ideas together, we would say there needs to be this direct connection 
between the immerser and the natural waters of the world. Now, what does that mean? What's the idea behind that? So most of the ideas I'm going to share with you now are based on an amazing book by Rabbi Arya Kaplan, which is called Waters of Eden, The Mystery of the Mikvah. It's also part of his anthology, Volume 2. And anyone who's interested in learning more from the practical to the mystical should definitely check out that book. It's an amazing read. And I'll link how to buy that book in the episode details as well. So again, we know that the power of the mikvah is to elevate spiritually in this transformational way from pure to impure, from non-Jew to Jew. So to understand the source of this power, we need to look at the source in the Torah of this distinction between purity and impurity of Jew and non-Jew. Where does that first show up in the Torah? And what do we learn from there about mikvah? Our rabbis teach us that while Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, pre-sin, there was no spiritual impurity that existed in the world. Death, which is generally the highest form of ritual impurity, coming into contact with a corpse, was an outgrowth of the sin of Adam and Eve. And the commentaries understand that not only death, which is an explicit outgrowth of the sin as described in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, but in fact, all tuma, all spiritual impurity that exists in the world is all an effect of the sin of Adam and Eve. And it did not exist prior to that. And if you look in a book called The Way of God by Ramchal, the great Kabbalist, he writes there also that there was no distinction between Jew and non-Jew in the Garden of Eden pre-sin as well. It was only after Adam's sins that there became this fragmentation and different human groups. So let's quickly look at that section of the Torah, and I think we'll see that the secret of mikvah is staring at us almost explicitly in those verses. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Torah describes the creation of Adam. Then in verse 8 and 9, it says that God planted a garden to the east with all types of trees for man. And then just before it finishes that thought, in verse 15, and says, and God places man and puts him in that garden, the Torah interjects with a seemingly random five verses. This is verse 10 through 14. In these verses, the Torah describes by name and by area and properties four rivers that flow out of the Garden of Eden. The Pishon River, the Gihon River, the Chidekel River, and the Pras River. And it's very strange because these rivers really don't seem to have anything to do with the storyline at all. God is in the middle of creating man and placing him in the garden. And seemingly for no reason, the Torah goes on to describe these four rivers. And the deeper sources teach us that these verses are teaching us the mystery of the mikvah. These four rivers represent the connection between the Garden of Eden and the rest of the world. The Torah is saying, God made man. That's verse 7. In verse 8 and 9, God makes the Garden of Eden. In verse 10 through 14, the Torah is describing the connection between Eden and the regular world at large. In case man would ever get lost and enter into that world, his way back would be through these rivers that are connecting Eden to the natural world. Only after that, in verse 15, does God actually place man in that garden and then give him the directions about the tree of knowledge. So these four rivers represent the connection back to the holy, pristine, pre-sin spiritual state of man. In the Talmud says something fascinating. The Talmud in Bechoros 55a says that all of the waters of our world, they're all sourced in the first three rivers listed, in the Pishon, the Gihon, and the Chidakel, and those three rivers are sourced in the river of Paras. So on a deeper level, the Talmud is teaching us that all the natural water in the world, if you enter into a natural spring, into the ocean, any natural body of water, that water is really coming from these four rivers that are connected to the Garden of Eden, connected to a spiritual existence in which impurity doesn't exist. So Kabbalistically, if I were to ask you, how does the mikvah work? Here's how it works. When you enter into natural waters and you completely submerge yourself with no separation, you're reconnecting yourself to man's perfected state. 
to the pre-sin Garden of Eden state of Adam and Eve in which no impurity existed. So naturally, when you're connected to that, any impurity that's on you leaves you. And I'll end off with one amazing medrash. If you look in Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, which is also sourced in the episode details, it says that we know God left Adam in the Garden of Eden after he sinned, like we spoke about two episodes ago. And when God kicks Adam out of the Garden on Saturday night, where does he go? So the medrash says, after he makes Havdalah, he went into the river of Gihon, and he stayed there for many, many weeks. Where does Adam immediately go upon getting kicked out of the garden? He goes to repent in the Gihon River. He understands that these rivers and the natural waters of the world is our connection back. It's our ability to elevate our existence and reconnect to that state comes through these waters. This is also why in some circles, many men have the custom to go to the mikvah right before Shabbos. Since Shabbos is a taste of the perfected state of man, of a perfect world, the greatest way to prepare yourself for Shabbos is by elevating yourself spiritually through the power of the mikvah. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Until next time, have an amazing week. Thank you for listening to the Thinking Jew podcast and for taking the time to study Torah and deepen your connection to Judaism. If you found value in today's episode, please leave us a rating or review and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or topic requests for Rabbi Moshe, please email the Thinking Jew podcast at gmail.com or visit thethinkingjew.com.